Hello and welcome to a special episode of Georgie's Stripping the Dipping podcast. I'm your co-host, F1 Blag, the formidable F1 Blag, as AMG Dens would call me. Uh, AMG Dens is out today. He's training intensively, both for uh, a 24-hour Le Mans race, sponsored by Bradley Philpott, but also the Mandem 500. More on that later. But without further ado, we've got a fantastic guest because at Stripping the Dipping, we try and strip back the layers, the superficial layers of motorsport, and look all over industry. So today we're going to talk to a business owner, a guy that owns a classic car bodywork bodywork reconstruction uh, firm. So without further ado, from from the suburbs of Northampton, perhaps, Mr. Martin Wilcox, how are you? Hello, I'm very well, thank you. Brilliant. Um, And... uh, so I, I kind of butchered that, but you're the owner of Z-Lines, is that right? And you, you restore yes, classic cars? Yeah, yeah like Fantastic. restore, rebuild, refurbish, Amazing. which way you're looking. But yeah. Well, um, what what you won't know if you're listening at home is that this afternoon I got a really uh, detailed list of all the different cars that you've restored. Um, and it's like you've almost got like a, a checklist of things you're trying to tick off. Um, well, they're the ones that I can team. remember. Not, yeah, not just the ones <laughs> that I've restored since been working for myself, but like for the companies that I've worked for along the way. And I've yeah. been very lucky, and you've worked on some very nice cars in the places that I've been. Fantastic. So, if you uh, have ever wondered about restoration of cars, or indeed wanted to know a bit more about getting into restoration or any form of sort of uh, mechanics, then this is the episode for you. So the the standard question we tend to ask, uh, Martin, all our listeners is, tell us a bit about yourself. So when if you were sort of meeting someone for the first time, how would you describe uh, Martin Wilcox? Um, well, I try to be a positive person, but um, I've been, <laughs> well, I say restoring cars since we left school, and that's been 30 years we've been doing wow. this. So. I started with an apprenticeship at a company called Shapecraft in Northampton. And I've worked in five different companies before I started working for myself. Amazing. Uh, and, and like, what's your, cause, cause obviously like, I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up, you know, who knows? Maybe I'll no. find Neither out. Did but... I. <laughs> exactly. I like when did accountant. you, Oh really? So what made you yeah. decide, you know what? I don't want to do that. I'm going to go and restore cars. Um, part of the school curriculum that we had to do, we had to do a work experience. And I knew Shapecraft in Northampton because my brother used to work in the company next door. And you always used to see the nice cars as you went through the door and you went to see my brother. And um, so their name was in the list of companies that was in the book of places that we could go for work experiences. So I wrote to them. They accepted me. I'd done a two-week work experience and it got to the end of the second week. I said, would there be chance of an apprenticeship? So I said, finish your exams and come back, which is what I did. Wow. So, uh, you know, if Shapecraft had totally been on chance. the list, who knows? Yeah, I wouldn't have yeah. done it. I wouldn't have been there. I would have been pushing pens and I'd been an accountant. <laughs> well, you know, shout out to all of our accountant chums. Uh, hopefully they give us a <laughs> discount rate on the tax return this year. But look... Um, you never so, know, so, but I uh, hope this has know. been a bit more of an interesting life. <laughs> Um, well, look, uh, what what first attracted you to cars? Because clearly you noticed Shapecraft because you said your brother was working nearby or yeah. next door. Like, what's your first memory of cars or cars. motor racing? Like I say, you know, when the first thing you can remember, the toys that you played with the toy cars, you know, when you were growing up, you watched Formula One on the television, touring cars. And as you got older, you went to the track to see them. You know, so it, there's always been cars about, always been interested. It was something that my dad was interested in, so you just sort of followed along. Brilliant. And now I'm going to ask you to age yourself by by telling me about who was driving in Formula One when you first set eyes on it. First started, uh, James Hunt was still racing. Ayrton Senna was just starting, so was Nigel Mansell. So, you know, you, you were looking at the end of the 70s, early 80s when I started watching it. Okay, quite a sexy time for Formula One. It uh, was a very good time for Formula One. A little yeah, bit better absolutely. than it is now, unfortunately. But it's getting better again at the minute, which is nice. The last couple of three years have been a bit more exciting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, made the racing a bit better. 
I'm keen to prick your brains about sort of mod- modern Formula One a bit later. But going back to that era, would you say yeah. that you had a favourite driver? Oh, definitely, yeah, and Senna. Definitely. Mm. From when he started, you know, you could tell he was just something special. You know, when he was with Lotus and then on from there. I say especially when he was with McLaren, he was, well, I think he was a lot better than Prost. I know there's going to be Prost fans out there that are jumping up and down. But um, <laughs> I just think he was probably the best driver that's ever been. We were just robbed of him a little bit too early. Yeah, that is a shame, isn't it? 90, we've just yeah. passed uh, the anniversary of his his passing and that of Roland Ratzenberger is a, you know, obviously it's a sad, from a human perspective, extremely sad, but also from a sporting perspective to see what might have happened with him and Schumacher. Uh, yeah, yeah, it would have entered in. It'd be nice if Roland Ratzenberger did better as well because he was really good in the touring car, wasn't he? When he used to race the M3s, didn't he, in the touring car? Yeah. And, so have you... You know, he was very good at oh. that. Get, on, so, on, but... on, those, on those cars, like just a bit of a... Because I'm definitely a Formula One guy first. Like road cars, yeah, yeah fine. You know, I, I get it. But a sports cars, fine. I, but I'm not an expert in that. Dens, my co-host, <laughs> is. But like, I'm a Formula One guy through and through. Like, that's that's me. Yeah. What about you? Because you restore sort of classic cars. So, so yeah, are you more of a sports are... car guy? No, they're mainly road cars. What we're trying road to cars. do. Um, place I've worked before. We have done race cars. I try mm. and steer away from race cars myself because with you get onto like, like the classic and historic racing that they do now, the races are every two or three weeks. They crash it this week, they won it back in three weeks. You know, it just <laughs> messes up any sort of restoration timelines that you've got. So I oh. try and steer away from race cars <laughs> simply for that reason. They're very nice to look at and you get some lovely cars to do, but it does run a very hectic schedule. Like I say restoring the road cars is a lot more sedate, shall we say, a lot easier Fair to enough. pencil in. And and so tell us a bit more about Z lines because you've got Z lines classic car bodywork restoration. What was your inspiration first behind the name, I guess, and then behind start oh, deciding to start up on your own? The name I really couldn't decide on a name. So um, when I used to work at Shakecraft. The boss there, Clive Smart, whenever he'd come and look at a car, especially the Zagatos, and we, we used to do a fair few DB4 GT Zagatos there, and you get the short wheel, like the Ferrari short wheel base and the lights. Because of the shape of the rear horns, like the rear quarter into the door, it creates a Z in the light line. And because the boss was, oh, look at the Z lines on that. So um, it was... So a bit of a, a nod to Clive, and I thought it'd make him smile when I called it, which it did. So, and that's how I got the name. Uh, that sounds like it could be a euphemism, you know. Look at the Z lines <laughs> on that, but uh... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, Clive, but no, I like it. You. But yeah, I know what you mean. So this has just popped into my head, and and it's probably because you're a better human than I am, or I'm a worse human than you. But look, you've got a Ferrari, or you've got like a really sort of prestigious car that you're restoring you can't yeah. tell me that you know you have to surely you take it for a bit of a test drive you know i'm not sure i've restored this fully i need to go no. and take it around the block no no the only cars i've ever been out in are when the owners brought them back because usually when they leave us they're not a running car if it's a customer's car so cars we do oh. ourselves we take them all the way through to a finish but if it's a customer's car i don't do the mechanicals as a business side at the moment so it will go elsewhere to be mechanically rebuilt. Fascinating. And and so yeah, you're, do, you're doing the body work? Too. Yeah, we do the body work, the chassis work, the woodwork, the trim. So, the trim? You know, you cover, yeah, the, the interior trim in the leather work, yeah. the carpets, the headlinings, and all that sort of stuff. Fantastic. And, and where do you get the materials for the trim? Because I suppose some of these classic cars are like really old school, you know, that leather, classic leather and things like that. Is it just normally available do you have to go and find other cars that you know had that or where do you get it from no there's a um we use a a, a leather wholesalers in rushton and they are very very good like saying it is right on our doorstep but there are several leather wholesalers around the country but these just happen to be a very good one and they're only 20 minutes away nice. which is nice and handy yeah so um i'm not going to say who uh dented my 
car. I had a BMW a while back, which Dems will hate <laughs> me for because he's more of a Mercedes. Uh, I was looking for a house. <laughs> I may have been behind the wheel, and I just sort of dented the side, the the door panel, trying to take yeah. a, you know, trying to reverse out, and then. You know, we could have sent it to the BMW dealer. In fact, the terms of the lease might have suggested that I do that. Um, but we didn't. We sent it to someone down in the country somewhere and it came back and looked good as new. So with a dent or a kind of a huge dip, what what techniques are you using to kind of bring that flush to where it should be? Um, usually you have to you have to shrink the metal back somehow if it's a if it's a really deep gouge. So I'd say on the newer cars, tend not to do newer cars because the metals are harder, metals are thinner. Most of what we do, is, you know, the whereas your BMW, the material is probably 0.8 of a mil thick. Most of the jobs that we do, the skin panels on them, if they're steel, are one mil thick, which doesn't sound a lot of difference. But that extra 0.2 of a mil makes an awful lot of difference when it comes to rework. So you can hotspot them. And there's two ways you can do that. You can either do it with an oxyacetylene torch and you make a nice little cherry round, sort of about the size of a 5p, and work it back with a, a mallet and weight. Or you can use a spot welder, like a, a single-sided spot welder, which is what I'd use for that sort of thing. Copper weight, a copper block on the back, a single-sided spot welder on the front, and it'll shrink your panel back. Wow. So you heat it up, basically? Yes. I say you do okay. get the people like Dent Doctor and all that, and they'll come out with the little prongs and pokes, and they can get like the little creases and the little bits out. But if you put a deep gouge in, then you'll stretch the metal and you've got to shrink the metal back to get it back to its original shape. No, that makes sense. And and the thing the thing I noticed when I got my car back was um yeah. if I knew what I was looking for or I looked at it at a particular angle, I could be like, Yeah, I can I can just about see uh where that was. So like when you're when you're restoring something, it might have like yeah. you know an imperfection in it. How do you? What are you doing with your eyes? Where? How, what angle are you looking at the car to make sure that it's flush and it's back to how it should be? Um, when we're like I say, if you're I don't know, shaping or repairing a panel, because like I say most of the panels we made they're made from hand. You know, the sheets mm. of aluminium or steel will come in. You're using an English wheel and um, I've got Eckhold shrinkers and stretchers. So you can only do two things to metal there. You can either sh shrink it or stretch it, and that's how you put the shape in. And as you put the shape in, the the panel forms a line. Like when you're looking down the side of your car, you can see the reflections, can't you, as to mm. of what's behind it. If you put, when we use fluorescent tubes, so you use vertical fluorescent tubes that you put at the back of the vehicle or the front of the vehicle, depending on which end you're looking at it, so if you're at the front, you put the lights at the back, and you can it will give you a straight line to work to. Yeah. So if you've got a nice even line on the curve, then you can see you've got a nice shape. But if you've got any divots in it, you'll have a little kick, a little flick in the line. It will show you where you've got to either put more shape in or less shape in to give you your straight line or your even shape. I mean, my question to you, because I'm, I'm naturally probably not great with my hands i can play the piano but i can't like you know i could i could do it at the allotment i could probably you know do a raised bed by hammering or screwing a bit of wood together but like yeah. the finesse that you must have when you're looking at the light reflecting back looking at that straight line like you surely you didn't just come out of school and be like yeah okay that's easy no, like, is it taking years to perfect the apprenticeship's usually four or five years and then you spend about another five six years on top of that getting experience so you know it's a good sort of 10, 12 years before you can think, yeah, you know, you're, you're pretty much confident on what you're doing. Yeah, it, oh, okay. Because every job's that little bit different. Yeah. And none of the cars you get to work on are cheap. <laughs> so there, there's I a risk. lot of responsibility. Well, yeah, it's a lot of responsibility in what you're doing. Because, you know, some of the cars are old. There's, you know, and there's a lot of history with some of them, especially the racing cars. You know, and you're it's then putting your hands to repair it and put it back to right. Yeah, you know, so there's an awful lot of responsibility on some cars. No, I can imagine. And and so talking about those cars that have come in, like yeah. what's perhaps your favorite car to have ever worked on? And then maybe it's the same answer, maybe it isn't, but what's the proudest you have been of a job that you've worked on a car? Well, favorite car I go for Lister Nobly. Just because I like the list of Nobly. It's a 
fantastic shape car and always fancy doing a hard top they never done it, it was an open top so it's like a d-type special frank costin redesigned it slightly and um basically made it a lower sleeker shape but the proudest we've ever been was probably a db4 gt zagato replica that we done for a belgian fellow named noel de Bloc. that was one of at shapecraft me and a bloke called steve matthewman done that and that job is probably the best job that you've done when you know and you've done some fantastic cars through the years but that is probably the best looking car that we've done everything just seemed to just look just right on it you, know, you couldn't pick fault and i'm looking at the list of nobly to begin with and like i just encourage you if you're listening at home just google that that's a beautiful a beautiful car yeah, and you're nice right about car, it being yeah. low yeah yeah, yeah. Stunning. I say I always fancy doing a hard top version. They never done one with a roof. So yeah, well, because you know. it's got such a raised back on it, it makes it yeah, you know, it would be a perfect car for a coupe. Yeah, it looks stunning. Mm. Um and, and like because this this raises a question, because you said I think is it a guy from like the continent you're working on that second car yeah. for, like from yeah but how how do you get your name out there is it are you really good at social media or is it like no uh, word of mouth this guy heard of you and was like i had to come and see you bit of both when since i've been working for myself most of the advertising has been done through social media i haven't placed an advert anywhere but it's like the db6 i've got at the minute in the workshop come from australia well, it's owned by an english person but it was the australian person that sold it that got me to do the job and then he sold it to an English person once it was here. I'm not saying that was from Instagram. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So what's your what's your shout out your Insta? I'm intrigued now. What's your Instagram? It's Z lines. Z underscore lines. Yeah. Wow. Well on that and on Facebook. I say there's a couple of thousand followers on Facebook and just over a thousand followers on Instagram. I haven't put a post on for a couple of months, but I say the last posts on Facebook got 30,000 views, you know, and it's amazing the, the response you can get from 10 pictures that you put on. Wow. Yeah. So I can see you've got your last post at time of recording. It looks like you've got like a shot of the workshop and yeah, just the it's chassis, the, the bare chassis of the car. Yeah. Go on. Yeah. The DB6 underbody. And that, that's the wow. one from Australia. That come in as a front end. So it's a front cross member and two front chassis legs. All the rest of it was it up to the bulkhead was there, but it was rotten, and the rest of it, <coughs> excuse me, the rest of it's been built from it. And then, how long would it take you? Because I'm looking. I really encourage you if you're listening at home, just go on Facebook. For those of you that still have Facebook, I know the kids out there sort of <laughs> yeah. get get ashamed of it, but like I'm showing my this, age. This car just looks like in some of the pictures, just some like metal work, very little um, skin on it. And and like how, from from that point to finishing it, how how long is that? That's got to be a year or something, surely. How long are you working on that? For me to build, and what you're seeing there is the super uh, the super Legera structure. For me to make that and put the aluminium bodywork on it, you're around two thousand hours. So you're looking <laughs> at a year's work. And then by the time it goes through the trim shop, the paint shop, the mechanicals, the electricals to do a full restoration it's probably going to be three years if everything doesn't have any hold-ups yeah and it is well, not a quick process no well time. to do it right no everything's got to be done in the right order and i say if you start rushing things and cutting corners you don't get the job at the end of it no well here's here's my question to you i don't know if you've watched your only fools and horses where um <laughs> Yeah. I might have said this before, Trigger's like Trigger broom. gets an award. Yeah, Trigger's Broom, yeah, exactly. So those of, those of yeah. you that are listening that are probably below the age of 35 or, you know, not from the UK, there's they're a sitcom. What we're on about. Yeah, they're like, what the hell are you talking about? There's a guy that is like <laughs> classic for being a little bit slow-witted and he was getting an award from the council for using the same broom for 30 years as a street cleaner. Uh, and he was like, the punchline is it's had six different heads and seven different handles. So <laughs> extending that to um, this, um, you know, re restoring a car, is there a premium on using original parts or 
are you just trying to create the aesthetic of what and, yes. and the sort of shape? Yeah, yeah. You're always trying to use. You're always trying to use as much of the original car as possible. And like I say, with mm. this particular DB suit, there's a front cross member and two front chassis legs left, and that was it. The rest of it just rotted into the nothing. But you're always trying to use as much as you can. But there are a lot of cars out there that are completely new, you know, or they might be a few years old now. But, you know, when they, they first see the light of day with a fresh paint job, everything about them is new. And they're still sold as original cars. Because broom. So again, it, it does happen. Again. Yeah, it does happen. Like I say, you'll get a, an old chassis number stamped on a new chassis and away mm. you go. But the the you know, people don't want that anymore. They want the traceability. It is what it's what separates like an original car from a recreation. Because there's so many exactly. like um continuation cars, shall we call them, that are made by the manufacturers. But they're not an original car. They are a 2020 car or a 2018 car or whatever but it's a continuation car not an original car and a lot of people still want the originals i'm sure they do yeah uh, is there paperwork that comes along in terms of that traceability or that authenticity is there any sort of paperwork that cars tend to have with them or not or not really yeah when you'll get service histories you'll get Obviously, your MOTs and the likes thereof, you can trace it depending on what country it's been in through registration documents and when it's changed hands from different owner to different owner. And then you always come back to the, the stamps that are on the car. So you've got the chassis number and the, the engine number and all that sort of stuff that's still stamped sort of throughout the vehicles. And like the Aston Martin, they have the chassis number that's stamped on the front, on the front cross member, and then they have a build number. And that build number will be stamped on the body, it'll be stamped on the doors, the bonnet, the boot, everything that comes off of it, or the trim will be stamped with that number. And it, it makes a difference if you've got then a car with matching numbers all the way through. Mm. And it's that the same sense. with most marks. If you see a car that's advertised with matching numbers, that's the one that's got like the engine gearbox, has got the same number as what it had originally. So you'll have the chassis number, the like the body number and the mechanical numbers will match. That makes sense. So, is, you know, so the, it is an easy way to trace through it. It's always more difficult if it's changed countries, which a lot of them do. But like I say, the, it's, it just takes a little bit more time to find the history. But it is well documented. You can easily trace. Even if it's been in a barn for 20 years, somebody knows where <laughs> it's been. You know, and yeah. it's amazing the things that do appear and somebody will know where it's been. There's still a, a paper trail of how it got there and how it's left. No, I guess so. And um, here's my question to you, because uh, we're, we're basically talking about cars that were designed, what, pre, pre-1980, pre-1970? I'm trying to, like, what's the, what's the cutoff what, if we the... talk classic? We say the word classic. Classics usually at the midnight sort of make to the 80s. But most yeah. of the stuff that we get involved with, it will finish in the 60s. And because the panels that we make, they're handmade. Yeah, so you'll have mm. a jig or a buck, whether it be fiberglass or wood or <clears throat> any particular resin. And like I said, they're, they're shaped by hand to fit on that buck and then they're put together. You get cars that are into the 70s onwards, they're pressed. Yeah, they're, they were pressed the panels that are then spot welded, whichever together. Mm. Anything that's designed to be pressed is always more difficult to make than something that's been designed to be made by hand. Yeah. So it, you, you can do it, but the costs rise. And being as the costs are usually in the older vehicles, that's why that that's usually what we end up restoring. No, that makes so sense. It, it, if it takes, as a rough rule of thumb, if you've got an open top car, you're looking at about 1,000, 1,200 hours. If you've got a fixed head car, you're looking at 2,000 hours. So to do that fixed a car, you're looking at 120, 130,000 pounds upwards. So you've got to have a, a big value in the car to make it worthwhile doing. Because once it leaves 
me with the 120,000 plus bill. It will then go to the paint shop where it'll have another 20,000. It will go to the trim shop where it'll have another 20,000. Then it will go to the mechanic shop where it can have another, you know, 60, 70,000 spent on it. So by the time you get to the end of it, you're quarter of a million quid into a car. You know, you, you've got to have an awful lot of value in the car to make it worthwhile at the end of it or great passion for it. You've made me feel extremely people. poor. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. I can't afford none of the cars I work on, so I won't worry about it. But um, <laughs> but now you do get cars that people make just for the passion. And we done one for a bloke called Tom Solly a few years ago. It was a Rover 20. You know, and the car's worth, you know, 15 grand, 20 grand maybe. But he must have spent 150, 160,000 pounds on this. And he was an old, old gentleman. When he had one, when he was convalescing here in the war, American fella, he got shot in the war, come back here to convalesce, and had a Rover 20 drophead, and he wanted another one before he died. He was lucky, he had a few, you know, he wasn't a poor fella. So he spent an awful lot of money getting this one done, exactly how he wanted it. So you do get to, you know, work on obscure things, but usually, like I say, you're down to the Aston Martins, the Ferraris, the Maseratis, the likes thereof that do have a large price tag that go with them because a lot wow. of people want to see some sort of return for the money. So they, and then people tend to trade those cars once they've been, or sell them on, or do, what? what is the kind of attraction um, or is it just they want to collect them? A lot of people are collectors when, like you say, you do get to do some cars for people that intend to use them. But the racing cars, they do get raced at the events like Goodwood, Silverstone Classic and the likes thereof. But a lot of the road cars, they'll be done and they come out too. So on the road cars, like I'm just thinking of other cars I've owned in my life. I'm not going to say them on, on, on the line because some of them are frankly embarrassing. Uh, some of them are French, French make of the mid nineties. So here's, here's my question. Like what went wrong in my view or what, what happened to car design that, you know, when you look back, I don't know, it just looks, you know, anything pre-1970 to me looks stunning. And then most things between about 1970 and, I don't know, 2015 look blocky and, I don't know, a bit hideous. Was it this? it was cheaper to make, mass produce a kind of blockier design or what, what happened with car design? And a lot of it's down to fashion. Mm. You know, and you get styles of what people like in the era, but a lot of it's down to... Um, like wind tunnels and like the, the design to keep it sleek, to keep it smooth, to get your efficiencies up. Then you come down to production methods. A lot of panels now are bonded on rather than welded on. So your panels are joined together different, which means that the shape of your car is going to be different. It's like everything used to have a drain gutter, didn't it, around the roof, where the, the roof was spot welded to the side structures. That will finish with a Ford Sierra that anybody will remember that one. Because the, the the technology behind joining the panels together changed. So as the technology changes, the way that you make the car changes, so the shape of it can then go to a different way. When look at bumpers now, and a bump will make up pretty much the whole of the front or the whole of the rear of a car because it's injection molded out of ABS. And they can just bolt on. Whereas forty years ago you couldn't do that. You get a picture of a Ford yeah. Sierra. <laughs> yeah. Not a car. I love it. I don't care. They were nice. Yeah. Well, no. What was that one? Was it? There was like a massive one, like a Ford Sierra Scorpio or something. In it. They done the Had RS Cosworth. That that was the RS. one that yeah. was the the very popular one. Um, like I say, that again, you know, they were sort of four or five years old, and the insurance was more than what it was to buy one because they were very stealable. Gosh. They it's like very really... 80s. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Very, very 80s. I say who yeah. it was 83, was it 84 they come out? But, yeah, but it absolutely. doesn't matter what, what point in history you pick on car design, cars always look very similar simply because that's what the fashion dictates. Hmm. But the way that cars look today has gone through like production processes. It's like you look at a Tesla now, and they are very jelly mob because they don't need the air intake at the front. It basically uh, super formed the chassis it's like an injection molded aluminium chassis in it that they use so it's all sort of made in three bits bolted together panels glued on and away you go it's very very kit form and our cars are made now 
if someone drove in with a Tesla, right? You'd yeah. be like, no, I can't deal with that here. Or could you no, could have a crack at it? <laughs> no, I wouldn't. I'd just send them down the road. I say anything that gets much into the seventies. I say I don't really do that much past it, simply because right. it's not going to be worth it for you know for the owner. You got to think of what the car's worth and what they get at the end of it. There, there are always the exceptions to the rule, but like you get the average classic, and it's just this why they've become rare because they're not worth restoring. And you get up until sort of into the nineties when they started galvanizing, yeah, you know, galvanized dip in the body shells. There's an awful lot that falls to bits before that. And it's like you were saying about your French car that was made in the nineties. I dare say it's still here. <laughs> but if you'd have bought that Ford Sierra, it wouldn't be because I, they weren't galvanized. I think my Mark II Clio is, uh, or Mark One maybe I don't know, is it probably a small cube of metal that's been squashed somewhere <laughs> in the West Midlands. Uh, Very depending probably on the... a washing machine by now, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's been recycled, sadly. But you know, yeah, uh, we'll, 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 you know, maybe one day I'll try and get one of those Williams Renault Clios that they had. They, those were a bit. Of they a were very nice, weren't they? Yeah. They were now, now we're nice. reminiscing about UK <laughs> yeah. uh, spec hot hatches, which will alienate yeah. most of our listeners. <laughs> it was um, a good era. It was a very good it, era for. Cars. I think it was a good era. Yeah. Go, five go. GT Turbo. There we go. Exactly. Mm. With a little spoiler on the back. Um, yep. Going going to classic cars, right? Because you talked yep. about fashions. What yep. like what's your what's your favorite classic car? Probably one that you like you've talked about that your favorite that you've worked on. Maybe one that you haven't worked on. Uh, one that then, I'd like to work on that I haven't. Yeah, that you Lamborghini yeah, exactly. Miura. Ooh, Definitely a Miura. Lamborghini Miura. Yeah. Yeah. I said that was a, a do you have a chance? Of working on that, uh, the, um, there's always the chance, but um, like you say, it is. I've like I said, I've been doing it 30 years, so I'm now 50. You got what 15, 16 years left of doing this, maybe, and I ain't even come near one yet. But um, you never know, you never know. But they are an awesome looking car, first yeah. rear engine sports car, and all because oh. the bloke that owned a tractor company wanted one engine in the back of a car, and Enzo Ferrari wouldn't do it. So he made his own. That is that's a legendary Lamborghini. story. Yeah, that's how Lamborghini started making cars. Just because Enzo Ferrari wouldn't put an engine in the back. Yeah, and eventually I guess he ate his words since, you know, that's where we are today. Oh, yeah. Or mid-engine at least. Yeah. Yeah. But um, no, the Lamborghini Mule, that's definitely the one that I'd like to work on. One that I wouldn't mind owning either. But no chance of that. So Lamborghini Miura, according to my yeah. good friend, Mr. Wikipedia... Um, only <laughs> 764 were built, right? So yeah, didn't make- maybe if you move to Italy, I don't know, you, know, <laughs> you could <laughs> relocate you to somewhere. In- <laughs> exactly. You never uh, know. Gosh. But no, they are a nice car. They do, like I said, they're made of steel, so they do rot. So there's always a good chance. Uh, and what about other... So, so we, you've got our listeners frantically going, like Googling beautiful cars. What is there another one that sort of comes to mind that you'd love to work on? That, that I haven't, or that I would. Yeah, you know, well, it can be that you have, them. but yeah, whichever. Yeah. Um, cars that you have worked on that I did like. I did like the Spiker, like the C Eight Laviolette. That was a lovely looking car. That was that was a nice one to work on. Um, I say for a new car or oh, a new car at the time. That was two thousand and <laughs> two thousand and two, was it? Somewhere around there, Ooh. and I said that was a that was a lovely looking car. Um, that does look pretty. Yeah, I said the interior and then was gorgeous. But um, other cars I like to work on um, an E type. I'd like to do a low drag E type at some point, and that is one that might be on the cards. So that's something that'd be nice to do in the next couple of three years, and it's something that's looking quite promising at the minute. Oof. Well, fingers crossed for you. And I say a lot depends on time. I know I stand a good chance of doing it because I bought the E Type four months ago to do it with. So it's just <laughs> a bit of time to do it. So that would be a personal project, would it? Yeah, that would be a personal project. So yeah. it, when I, as and when you get a bit of time to do it, that's always the difficult bit. When you're trying a lot of bit of time and then another job comes up and another job comes up and customers have to come first at the minute. 
How many uh, how many cars do you think you work on concurrently? Else. Yeah, yeah. Well, currently in the um, workshop and in progress. Or, or, or just at the same time. What's the maximum? You know, because we've probably got some many billionaires here listening that are thinking this is the guy that's going to restore well, my car. So, how many do you think you can fit or, or work on at the same time? I only usually work on two, maybe three at a time. Mm. When, like I say, it, it keeps the number small. It keeps things reasonably simple to organise. And if anything comes to a stop, you can always move on. You know, people can be swapped about, moved about. But if you get too much, you know, it just gets too complicated. It's easier to have, like, a, get a car done quicker and out and get the next one in than what it is have lots of projects in that just drag on forever. Customers prefer it as well. It keeps everything moving. Like I say, you try and do things in sort of a three-year span. If you get any hold-ups, that can, you know, it can soon escalate. So if you can get a job done quicker or, or out of my shop quicker into the next part, then all the better it is for the owner. Gosh, that that is an attitude that I wish the kind of uh, people that I try and contract in my area had. But I'm trying to get my garden done and they've said it was like last summer and we're at this summer now at this point. So yeah, I think you're right. Like not yeah. having too much of a backlog is probably the best way to manage customers. Although you don't want yeah, to dry well, up. I've still got a, couple, you know, I've got a couple of years of work sitting on the books waiting to come through you know so there's mm. plenty to come into but like i say you don't want to keep things you know you want to get things through the pipeline as quick as you can no yeah of course. You know, it's better for everybody so you you talked a bit about sort of trying to steer clear of racing cars uh these days uh given yeah. their drivers tend to prang them a bit i'm actually going yeah. to the goodwood festival of speed um this year have you i, I take it you've been it's been, it's been goodwood nice. in never been Oh. I've never been. I've been to the um, the classic. No, I've been to the Festival of Speed twice. I've but I've never been to the Revival. I said, yeah, that's it. I've been to a couple of times, yeah. but I've never been to Revival. Usually go to Silverstone Classic because you know, it's just down the road. It's a nice, easy day out, and it's pretty much the same event. But um, I say the atmosphere at Goodwood is meant to be good. And we're doing okay. intend to go with another e type that we're doing. Sort of won't be next year, but probably the year after. I think it's a good point to market it and sell it, and with a bit of luck, get a bit of interest in the lightweight that we're doing as well in the low drag. Yeah, I can imagine that will get you a, a lot of a lot of interest. I mean, you could Hopefully. trick someone into buying it that you know crashes a lot, and then you know you've got <laughs> you <laughs> hire a few more a people. You got some business. Yeah, you got a continual work stream, <laughs> then, don't you? Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Um, like, here's a question that actually it relates to racing. And you sort of implied earlier that you do watch a bit of Formula One these days as well. Yeah. My 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 view is that right because of the huge strides in safety and technology, driving standards have kind of dropped. Because you know, if you have a prang in a Formula One car, unless it goes extremely wrong, you're going to just get out and walk off. And yeah, they do you know, expect you couldn't to take walk that away these days. Yeah. I say if you'd have gone back you know, even 15, 20 years, some of the mm. things that they have today you wouldn't get away from. No. You know, and the carbon fibre technology has come on phenomenally to make the car stronger. Exactly. But again, then again, so like the, like the, um, like the halo that comes around the head, I say giving the driver a bit of protection from anything sort of coming in as an impact, whether it be a wheel or another car mm. or whichever. I said that the safety, you can see why you got to put the safety in. And nobody wants to see anybody get hurt. But yeah, it does make people complacent. Hmm. So it's the same with the runoffs. You know, and you got an awful lot of runoff on corners now. What's wrong with the gravel track? If you make a mistake, you're in the gravel track, you don't get out. Whereas as it is, you go around the runoff area and you're back in the race again. And sometimes it's faster. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like I said, there's, there's, there's good things. Obviously, you know, when, you know, nobody wants to see anybody getting hurt. But I don't think it's done an awful lot for the racing. It's the same as well, the the electrical systems in the car. It makes them that heavy. And they're huge now, aren't they, compared to what they were 25, 30 years ago. Yeah. And Alonso summed it up the best. A couple of three years ago, he was in one of the press conferences. And he says he thinks he's the only person, when there were sort of six or seven drivers there, and he said that he was the only driver there that would probably still remember when the lights go out, racing until the flag waves at the end of it. He says, now you're saving your tyres, you're saving your fuel, you're saving mm. your battery. Everything's about 
economising, not about racing. You know, making everything last to the end. You know, you've got to do however many races it is now on an end. They get two powertrains, don't they, now to last 23 races? That's crazy. Races. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Whereas, 20, 20, you know, you yeah. go back into the 80s and they could have four or five engines in a weekend. <laughs> Yeah, the Brabham qualifying yeah. engine, which was like a BMW or so, or was it Alfa Romeo? I can't yeah. remember, but it was sort of BMW, high, high yeah, turbo. It was a stupidly yeah. overpowered. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, Formula One has changed an awful lot. You know, and the size of the teams now. And, you know, you, you go back into the end of the 70s, into the 80s, like McLaren probably had two ish, 2,000 people working for them, tops. You know, and, and now you look at it, the you know the aerodynamic department is probably that size. So it, it's changed from a sport to a business, isn't it, as well? Which has done it some favours, not others. For sure. And and who would you say your favourite driver is in this in this current modern era? Current era. Yeah, like still driving, or has <laughs> been driving up until the last couple of years. Yeah. Up to the last couple of years, I go for Vettel. I th- he mm. was very good driver. I say he he got better as he got older. Same as Alonso now, he, he gets better as he gets older. He he takes he doesn't seem to throw his toys out the pram quite as often as he used to, and blame everybody else when something goes wrong. And let's say you got a yeah, if you make a mistake, you got old your hands up. You know, that's me. I didn't. You know, he did didn't get the most out of the car that day. He didn't make, get the most out of the car that weekend, whichever. So, but no, there are some good up-and-coming drivers. And hopefully, I say they'll carry the sport on into the future. Where it's nice to see Russell doing well. And he seems to be getting on remarkably well at Mercedes. So, yeah, is Rando nice? Hopefully going to be another great driver of the future. So, um, you know, there's still a lot of up-and-coming talent in the sport. Yeah, and there was a moment um, in the late... Well, when was it? Damon Hill would have retired in 1999. And then I think Jensen yeah. Button appeared. And so there was quite a period when there was like one British... Oh, well, of course I was there. But yeah, there was like a couple of seasons when yeah. there was like one British driver. And now we seem to have quite yeah. a good range, actually. Yeah, like you say, but there's a nice range of nationalities all the way across there now, isn't there? And like you say, yeah, it yeah. used to be a few British, a few French, a couple of Germans, and that was about it. Anybody else that come along didn't really do very well. But now yeah. there seems to be a lot more opportunity coming, simply because yeah. it is more of a, a multinational sport now. When it used to be very European, you know, even though you race around the world, everything was a very European focus on it. Whereas now it does seem to be taking a lot, you know, the rest of the world into consideration a lot more. Absolutely. Um, and it, it makes as, it a world championship. You know, it's meant to be yeah. a world champion. But when you look at, you go to America and you look at World Series baseball, there's only those in Japan that play it. I mean, it's not really much of a World Series then, is it? So, you know, you, to be a world champion, you've got to include the world, whether it be, you know, racing drivers, the lot. You know, the circuits where you go, the countries that you go to. Make it as inclusive as possible. For sure. <laughs> I, I wonder though, there's probably a maths here because clearly we want it to be inclusive, but I can't see how they're going to do more than the. They had 23 races on the calendar this season and then China yeah. dropped out, so it went to 22. Are they going to have yeah. to do fewer European races or something? Like, how are they going to manage that to get to get that inclusion? Oh, don't know. This is going to be the difficult bit, isn't it? Do you go back? I don't know if you, when you started watching the racing, but you went back, you used to have 16 races a year but you only used to use sort of your top 11 or 12 finishes. You, know, you didn't, not every point counted. If, if you had three or four bad races, you wouldn't count those towards your championship points. So do you do the same sort of thing where you could have 26, 27 races, but you wouldn't have every driver at every race? Yeah, it's a good point. I think if I like, so the drivers is one thing, but I kind of feel for the mechanics uh, and, yeah. and the kind of the trackside team that are traveling. Yeah. I think what have we got? So this weekend, it, Imola could be rained out. But then I think it's the start of a triple header, um, yeah. which includes Monaco and another circuit. And um, the logistics of sort of turning up on a Wednesday and then a Thursday, getting the car out, 
and then by the Sunday night, they're mainly packed up, drive off on the Monday and start again. It just seems... Yeah. And but, you're doing but, that from March know. through to November. Yeah. yeah. It gets a long year. It gets a very long year. Hmm. So, yeah. which is where if you didn't have to race every race, you might pick where you're going, which track suits your car's strong points. Oh, it's going to be a bit disappointing for the fans because they're not going to see them at every race. Hmm. But it might make cars strong. You know, your, your racing might be better, even if your favourite driver's not there. Yeah. Well, who's so you've mentioned Vettel is probably your favourite modern era driver or from recent years. You talked about Senna yeah. before. Have you got a team that you tend to follow or prefer? Always like McLaren. Mm. So, yeah, yeah, obviously you grew up with Senna and I know he was Lotus for the start, but you he was more, always more successful with the McLarens. You always followed him with that. And it's always nice to see him doing well, unfortunately, not so well at the minute. Mm. It'll be nice to see him back on top again at some point. Yeah, so, it's I say, yeah, McLaren's one. definitely a, I'd say one of the favourites, definitely. Mm. They've um, they sort of dropped off because they, obviously they were, you know, <clears throat> dominant in the 80, late eighties. Yeah, Williams had their period on top. Then McLaren sort of came back before Ferrari. Then had their dominance, but then McLaren sort of always been there or thereabouts. And yeah, you know, the turbo been hybrid two or three era destroyed them. Yeah, they, but then they were coming back, weren't they? Yeah, we've sort of yeah. Norris was doing really well, yeah, and then this they year just they just seemed backpedaled yeah. again. Yeah, it is. But it shows how good the competition is. Mm. You know, when you've only got to have a slightly poor design. Look at Mercedes. And how many years were they head and shoulders above everybody? And now they've mm. had two years in the doldrums for them. I know they've been finishing sort of third, fourth. But but exactly. it, it's not a good it's not a good finish for them, is it? You know, and I know no. it shows how good they've been when they can say they've had a bad year and still finish sort of third in the Constructors' Championship. But... You only have to drop the ball a little bit and it takes you four or five seasons to catch back up again. Yeah. And it to me, I don't know what you think. So just like talking about Red Bull at the moment, it just feels to me like they're gonna they're gonna be on top until the regulations change. They feel like they've got something in hand. Probably. And they might not be yeah. pushing. Yeah. Yeah, very yeah. probably. But it's that's what Mercedes were last time. And on that particular set of rules, they dominated. And it wasn't until you changed the rules that somebody else got on top. And yeah. like you say, is the cars are so technical. Everything is so fine, like the levels that they perform to. If one mm. of those levels isn't at 100%, if you're down to 98%, it makes such a difference on the overall characteristics of the car. Like I say, it's whether you can get back over it or not because of budget caps and times that you get for testing limited. You know, unless you hit the ground running, it is a big struggle no for sure um and we'll see you know it remains to be seen maybe the uh cost cap penalty on you know that's limiting the aero testing for red bull will achieve yep. something and bring maybe make a difference yeah maybe we yeah. don't know and we'll see we'll see who breaks the cost cap uh or f is found to break the cost cap this year you know who somebody will be. they always push the rules yeah. as much as they can but that's what you have to do at that sort of level if you operate well with inside the rules you're not going to win it's the same as yeah, everything, well, whether it's you know in the development, in the office, in the design, or on the track, you've got to be at 203%. And if you're not pushing the boundaries, you're not you know pushing the rules as much as you can, then you're not going to win. No, my, my favourite, I think, is the Tyrrell from something like 1984, which is when Martin Brundle sort of turned up. They would fill the car with water towards the end of the race. Yeah, uh, to make sure it met the minimum weight test at the end. Yeah. Um, is it? You know, I guess technically it didn't break the rules, but clearly there was there were politics at play and and the spirit of the rules. Perhaps it it didn't quite follow, so they were DQ'd. But it's it's part of what racing is. It's finding what oh. rules you can bend as much as you can without breaking them. And until they change the rules, you're not breaking it. I say probably not in the spirit of racing, but. Everybody does it, you know. If you're not doing it, mm. you're not at the, you know, you're not going to be at the front. So, but it's always, you know, it's always nice to see. It puts a bit of smile on the face when you look back with at those sort of rules. You know how rules get broken or bent. Should we say? <laughs> so hard segue. Speaking of bends, do you have any? Uh, do you 
you have any favourite circuits? You talked about sort of looking at uh, expanding the world championship to make it truly global. Have you got a particular track? I know you live 10 miles away from, or 10 minutes away, sorry, from Silverstone. Yeah. Silverstone's always going to be your favourite just because it's yeah. right on your doorstep. Yeah. But Hockenheim's always a nice one to sit and watch a race round. Spa's yeah. always the, the, nice the modern one. Race round. The yeah. modern race tracks. Yeah. I don't know. Sochi, maybe. It's, it's a nice, it's a changeable track, and it? It's got a, They've done well with the design on it. It's got some classic parts to it. It's got some newer parts to it. Mm. But there's, you know, and there's a lot of new tracks come on that are, they've got to grow on you. Yeah. Yeah. And the older tracks, they've, they've got prestige because of how long they've been used. Yeah. Mm. It, it, it doesn't matter what track you get when guaranteed they're not going to race the, exactly the same track for the first two or three years because they're going to think, oh, I can improve that a little bit. I can improve that a little bit. So once it's been through sort of five or six seasons, then you start getting into a, a truly good track. So I can remember when Suzuka came on and everybody moaned at that. Now that's a, or it was one of the better tracks that they race on. So, you know, it's tracks take a little while to develop. I don't think any of them stay 100% the same. They change the corner a little bit. You know, it's just out of changing the curb height a little bit. Or like we were saying before about the gravel traps and the runoffs. They'll put a ground trap here, a runoff there, and it just makes it that more entertaining. What's uh, what's intriguing to me, and you mentioned it earlier, because I think the cars in maybe like nineteen ninety four, the cars were as low as sort of five hundred kilos, something like that. Yep. And now they're up at the eight hundred. Like yeah. the the characteristics of tracks change when you have a different size of car. So mm. like the larger the to. car, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. When. We'll take Sills as an example, just because it's here. So, you know, it's one that I know well. But you look at the shape of what the track is now, especially if you go to a classic car race, and the cars are flat out for 90% of the track, which suits the modern cars. You know, they're built for that sort of racing. Whereas the older cars, you'll get some that were good at this, you know, uh, for straight out speed, some that were better around the corners. And mm. you always got the more sort of, Defined tracks, you know, you'd, you'd you'd have cars that were better in certain areas on certain tracks, which now the tracks all seem to be very similar, if that makes sense, you know. And yeah. They all seem to have a, a couple of three speed straights and a couple of three twisty bits, and there doesn't seem to be that much definition, you know. Yeah. Obviously, that they're, they're they're doing it, you know, to keep the racing as close as possible. But then the cars no, are sure. pretty much the same. The, and, and the challenge you've got, I suppose, in modern Formula One is the size of the cars means that you're not going to get three wide racing or difficult no. to follow or, you know, yeah. the weight, the amount of weight you're trying to decelerate means yeah. that the braking zones or, or, the, or sorry, the modern brakes being so good, it just makes it difficult to kind of see that overtaking that you'd perhaps want to see. Yeah, but it's like the modern racing line's different to what it was, you mm. know, 15, 20 years ago. Like you say, because... The acceleration lines are great now, and the aerodynamics are great. They break as late as they can into a corner, take as sharp a line as possible, and accelerate out the other side. Whereas if you'd have gone back 25 years, you carried the speed through the corner. Because the, the, like the technology and the acceleration of the cars is different, you drive the car different. Which, again, with the modern tracks, they design the tracks different to suit the modern cars. You've, you've almost convinced me to get a VPN and, and buy... Uh... Form, or get the F1 TV app uh, and go back and look at some classic races. Um, <laughs> but we'll, would, we'll have to make... Go on, sorry. Yes, I would always say I'd watch a few of the older races. I'd like, say so you, you see them, even if you look just through YouTube, you will find the older races, sit and have a watch, because it is a totally different experience to what you'll get watching them on the Formula 1. Absolutely. Even well, if it's just for Murray Walker's commentary. I was literally going to say, yeah, just when you hear Murray Walker, you hear the old F1 theme, the jingle, yeah, uh, and then uh, is, off you go. Like you say, it is a totally different experience, especially if you get with James on, on as well. They used to bounce off each other quite well. Yes, with one microphone, I'm told. So there was a bit of yeah. a wrestle over who was speaking, yeah. Yeah, half the time, apparently, James just used to take the microphone off of Murray just to wind him up. <laughs> exactly well look um it's been a fascinating conversation really fantastic to hear um basically how you restore classic cars and 
and and you've given us some Google uh, sort of tips. We're going to go and look up some of those cars. I've got the Miura now, probably as my phone background forever. So I do hope that you know a, a wealthy car collector knocks on your door and says, "Oh, I'd really love you to restore this in the not too distant future." So I hope if they don't, I really think it's crossed you. Know. <laughs> yeah, please do. Anybody that's interested in car restoration, and there's mm. a lot of stuff on YouTube you can see on our project are done. Racial Lean, Pro Shaper, he is a very good person to watch, American person. I say, but yeah. programs like that, Jay Leno's always a good one. And, you know, there's a Absolutely. lot of programs about you can find how things are done. Even if you, you know, you want to take it to your own project, your own cars, if whether you're making like a, a kit car or the store in a classic. It's all the same principles. Gosh. Well, I you know, if, if I had a garage, you know, I'd, I'd almost certainly buy that Renault Clio and then I'd <laughs> almost certainly dent it, which means I'd have to fix it. But uh, <laughs> uh, it's been really fascinating. Um, any, any, before you leave us, anything, and I'm going to ask you the critical question in a minute, yep. but any, any, um, Anything you want to point our listeners towards? Anything you want to shout out, or any message you want to leave um, our listeners? Oh, well, like I say with car restoration, if anybody's listening because they want it, it's not a bad time to get into the industry. You know, there's a lot of opportunities. There's a lot more opportunities now than what there was when I left school. And I say I was lucky, hundred percent lucky where I got. But now there's a lot of courses, Heritage Skills Academy. You know, they do a lot of training, whether it be mechanical restoration, bodywork paintwork you know, you know there's a lot of places now that are opening up so it is a lot more accessible to anybody that wants to get in fantastic well i do hope i do hope that any budging um you know restorers people that want to work on cars um take heed um and they and they look at those opportunities but before we go right there's a fundamental yep. question we ask all our guests we've asked uh I always say this person. We've asked uh, Mario Andretti. He had a very strong view. Uh, we've asked uh, who else? Have we asked like lots of. Uh, we've asked Brian Herter of uh, IndyCar fame. Who Ooh. you know, I love IndyCar, but we haven't covered it today. Yeah. And and he he was more relaxed. So the question is, pineapple on pizza? Yes or no? Definitely, most definitely. Whenever wow. I have pizza, ninety percent of the time it'll be Hawaiian. I do like wow. it. Wow. Give it a nice. It adds a bit of sweetness to it. The tomato can often be just that little bit too sharp. And you get a bit of pineapple on it, that little bit of sweetness takes it all away. Especially with the You need to get into advertising. Wow. That's, a, <laughs> That's a, fantastic. A nice smoked ham on it as well. Goes lovely. Fantastic. Well, look, if you need, no, if you're no, going to franchise some sort of pizza business, I'm happy to work for it. That sounds, uh, <laughs> sounds lovely. I'm hungry now. I've had my dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Well, Georgie's going to be happy because Georgie uh, is the pineapple team and I'm the non-pineapple team. So while while I'm left wow. disappointed, you've made her day. So congrats. Which way did Mario jump? He said no. He was very Italian about it. It was like, no. Oh. Like, it was like, there was that. No, I know. Sorry. I didn't want to lead I the witness. So I didn't yes. tell you. <laughs> no, I thought it'd have but, been a yes. You know, yeah. say, is, I thought being Italian passionate, it'd have been a yes, but never mind. Yeah, he was. Yeah, well, you know, we'll. Um, what we might do is create a, a, t a tally chart of our guests. I, I think pineapple is quite, quite popular. We do have some fence sitters that say, "Oh, not for me," but I wouldn't, I wouldn't deny anyone their right to pineapple. But I, I like you. You kind of were very direct. Yeah, you, you yes, gotta, absolutely. Yeah, you got to <laughs> jump down one side or the other. You can't sit on the fence over yeah, something as important exactly. as that. No splinters in the bum. Uh, you, you're off the fence. <laughs> exactly. Definitely. Brilliant. Not. Well, look, uh, Martin, thank you so much for joining us. Really, no, thank really you for having me. Thank you for having me. We'll have, I've enjoyed the conversation. Well, we'll have to, no, thank you. We'll have to have you on again. But also, I encourage people to go and check out your Instagram and your uh, Facebook, which is um, Z underscore lines. And yeah, you yeah. can see like just from, it looks like it's from scratch or someone's brought you like a, a little tiny bit of a car and you're building something out of it. So a lot of cars um, that we have built over the years have been from scratch, you know, and they have been from nothing. Wow. You know, it's, 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 it's nice when you get a project like that sometimes because everyone thinks, oh, it's such a daunting job going, you know, building a car, but it's, it's not a big job. It's just lots of little jobs that you put together in the right order. Gosh, that almost sounds like philosophy. Uh, very good. Oh. 
Brilliant. Well, um, that, that that wraps up today's show. Um, please do, uh, if you, wherever you listen to us on your pat- platform of choice for podcasts, please give us a five-star rating or a favorable review or just comment and tell us what you like to hear about or ask us any questions. Um, you can listen to us on YouTube or your podcast platform of choice, as I've said. We're on Twitter at Strip the Dip. Uh, and that's a handle that we tend to use consistently uh, across social media. So until next time, um, with great thanks to Martin Wilcox, I've been your co-host, F1 Blag, and we'll see you soon. Goodbye. <laughs>